Okay, thanks very much, and uh, thanks for being here today. Um, so, in 1974, André Veil gave a lecture course here at the Institute, actually. Um, I mean, I wasn't there or anything, but his notes uh, <laughs> were published in this really nice book um, called Elliptic Functions According to Eisenstein and Kronecker. And I'd like to start, because some of the themes have been very influential for my own research, I'd like to start pretty much at the same place that he does with a very simple example. Namely, let us begin by considering the sine function. And I'll introduce the sine function as an explicit infinite product And of course, this infinite product, this particular one, has a very long history. And famously, it was used by Euler to evaluate the Riemann zeta function at even numbers. But I'd like to talk about something else, uh, more specifically its values. So the values of this sine function at arguments that are actually rational numbers are very special. They're algebraic. So that means that. There are solutions to polynomials with integer coefficients. For instance, just to give you a bunch of um, simple examples, if we take the sine of pi over 4, we get the square root of 2 over 2. If we take the sine of pi over 8, we get the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 over 2. There's a lot of interesting things to say about these numbers. Um, but uh, the mere fact that they're algebraic is not a terribly deep fact. And if you think about it, you'll very quickly find a proof. So I'd like to move on to a similar situation, which is um, considerably deeper. And that's to replace the sine function by some other analytic function. And let's consider the modular j invariant, which is one of the most well-known examples of a modular form. In this case, it's an SL2z invariant function on the upper half plane. And in particular, it has a Fourier expansion, which happens to start off like this. Q inverse where Q is e to the 2 pi iz. Oh, and of course, this continues. This wouldn't be very interesting if not. So a little bit less well known is the fact that you can also write this as an infinite product, just like the sine function. Uh, one way to do this is there is some expansion that starts off like this and also continues. Uh, this is part of the theory of so-called Borchardt's products. There's, in fact, an even better way to write the j function as an infinite product indexed by elements of the group SL2z. But it would lead me a little bit too far to actually say what it is. And by sheer coincidence, uh, uh, tomorrow, John Halliday is going to give a talk about exactly this in the number three learning seminar, uh, which is at 2 PM in this room. So I won't steal his thunder. And I'll just move on to what I actually want to talk about. This particular infinite product has a very similar behavior in the sense that its values this time at arguments in imaginary quadratic fields. So imaginary quadratic. <coughs> are also algebraic. And just to give you a couple of examples, for instance, if you take the j invariant of 1 plus the square root of minus 67 divided by 2, you end up getting an integer, a very special one. If you factorize it, you get this number. Another example would be the j invariant of minus 5, which turns out to be this number. So I realize at this point I'm just showing off that I've memorized all of these numbers <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> but I'd like to also point out some interesting facts about them. So for instance, already, it's quite miraculous that, if you that, that well, yeah, exactly. Don't, don't hold me to this. Well, it's being videotaped, so I guess I better hope that this is correct. <laughs> That's right. That's right yeah. 
Okay, so I'd like to point out some, some things about this. I mean, already the fact that this is an integer is sort of a miracle. Um, but moreover, these, these specific prime numbers that appear in its factorization, they're all quite small numbers. Uh, and it turns out, for instance, one aspect of them that's quite interesting is that they're all, they all remain prime in the imaginary quadratic field, uh, q joint square root of minus 67. And these exponents here also, they have an interpretation of certain arithmetic intersection numbers. So they're very rich arithmetic quantities. Um, so that brings me to the next topic. So 1975, that's the year that this book came out um, by André Veit. <laughs> and so roughly a decade later, Gross and Zagier arrived at the scene. This was in 1985. Sorry? Gross and Zagier? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, sorry. I... <laughs> 83. <laughs> roughly a decade later. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Oh, nobody was paying attention to this. Okay, well, let's all pay attention to it today. So, Gross and Zagier arrived at the scene, and they did something that looks a little bit strange at first. So they considered, they took a tau 1 and a tau 2, which were imaginary quadratic, And they considered the quantity j tau 1 minus j tau 2. Right? So by the way, these special values are tremendously interesting things. And they're usually called singular moduli. So that's this word that appears in my title. So Gross and Zagier considered a difference of two singular moduli. And so the geometric picture to have in mind is that the j function has as its domain the upper half plane which I'll call h infinity. And so this difference of two j functions is a function on the product of h infinity with itself that's invariant under the action of the group SL2z times SL2z. Okay. To be perfectly precise, they really consider the norm of these numbers, which is now an integer. So it's some explicit integer that they cook up. That's what this subject called CM theory tells us. Now, what they do is they find an explicit formula for it. And what's so groundbreaking about their paper is not so much this explicit formula, but the way in which they prove this explicit formula. And they, in fact, give two proofs. So the, the first proof is entirely analytic. And the analytic proof goes by considering a certain family, a real analytic family uh, of automorphic forms. Particularly, it's a real Eisenstein family. So I don't want to really get into the, the specifics, but just for, for the experts who know what this means, is they take, they take a Hilbert um, modular form in two variables, an Eisenstein series, depending on some complex parameter s. And they're restricted to the diagonal. So they set the two variables to be equal. And they note that when you specialize this to s equals 0, you should get something in rate 1, 1. But in fact, this vanishes. It's a very famous um, result, which goes by the name of Hecke's sign error. Because he, yeah, I know, it's a, it's a little weird. But that's, it's the thing. So this is known as Hecke's sign error. It's a little cruel if you think about it. I mean, you're, you're Hecke, and you're proving all these amazing results. And then you put a plus one instead of a minus one once. And a century later, everyone's still talking about it. So it's, it's a little bit cruel if you think about it. But that's how this is um, referred to usually in the literature. But for Gross and Zagier, this is interesting. Because if this vanishes, they can look at the first order derivative. And that's really the series that uh, has in its Fourier coefficients something very closely related to these quantities. So that's how they prove this explicit formula, the analytic way. They also have an algebraic proof. And this algebraic proof relies very heavily on, this, on the theory of CM elliptic curves. And it gives this interpretation in terms of arithmetic intersection numbers of these exponents. So if you uh, kind of develop both of these arguments a little bit further, and that's what they did after that, you get from this the gross Aguirre formula. It's an extremely important and celebrated result in number theory 
And I'd just like to mention it because this is such an important result. And it's beautiful how this, uh, this paper really takes this very innocuous looking expression, the difference of two singular moduli, and turns it into what is today still one of the biggest chunks of uh, everything we know about the Birch and Swinnerton die conjecture. So it's, it seems like an important thing um, to investigate. And that's why we would like to generalize these types of results to other number fields, so not just imaginary quadratic fields, already say for real quadratic fields, we don't really have good analogs of all of these quantities. Sorry, is there a question? Yeah, oh, I actually forgot to draw this on my picture. But you see, if you're an imaginary quadratic number, you get a point in the upper half. And so you get a pair of points like this. If they're imaginary quadratic, they lie in the upper half plane, or you can find one that lies in the upper half plane. And so you can evaluate this j function at these two points. Whereas for a real quadratic number, in fact, I'll show you in a second what the problem is, you can't do this. Uh, so first I should mention that this is joint with Henri Darmont. And what we do is we find analogs where instead of imaginary quadratic things, we take real quadratic arguments. And so to answer your question, the picture here is quite different because you see if we consider the upper half plane h infinity, which is the domain of the j function, if you're a real quadratic field, by definition, if you're a real number, you're not inside of this upper half plane, you're just on the boundary. So all you get is really a geodesic in the upper half plane between tau 1 and its conjugate. Okay. But we would really like a point where we can evaluate functions. We know how to do that in a meaningful way. So the trick that we use <coughs> is we replace this second occurrence of the upper half plane by a suitable piadic analog. So this is usually called the Poincaré upper half plane. And this goes by the name of the Drenfeld upper half plane. So there, there is a good analog for the usual upper half plane over the piadics, and it's much harder to draw a picture of, but if you force me to, I would probably uh, draw something like this. So this is a p plus one regular tree, and you should imagine the piadic upper half plane has a sheet that sort of hangs around this, uh, this tree. Okay, so more specifically what we do is we now want an analog of this group action, is SL2Z times SL2Z, and we take instead the group SL2 Z1 over P. So this is an arithmetic group, which also came up in Shai's talk, which acts diagonally on the copy of these two um, half planes. And so what we do is we consider this rather mysterious looking cohomology group of this group SL2 Z1 over P acting on meromorphic functions on the piadic upper half plane. Okay. And this maybe seems a little bit like black magic, but what comes out of this is something very concrete uh, because this allows us to construct, again, via infinite products, uh, an analog of the quantity j tau 1 minus j tau 2, which of course in the literal sense does not make sense anymore in this real quadratic setting. So without telling you too much about the specifics of this, I'll, I'll just give you one example of the types of invariants that we end up constructing. Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to say what j of tau 1 is if tau 1 is real. It's just a quantity that behaves like j tau 1 minus j tau 2 would for imaginary quadratic fields where we know what that means. So I didn't say exactly what happens, but there's a lot of arithmetic things that you can say about these numbers. And we seem to be able to get the same arithmetic statements about these other invariants that we construct out of cohomology classes in here. So to tell you exactly how that goes would take a little bit more time, but there's some explicit procedure that goes via infinite products that starts with an element in here and an RM point and spits out a number. So it's an algebraic number, J. Conjecturally, yeah. Conjecturally, exactly, because we don't have CM theory, of course, uh, or RM theory, as it would be. So just to give you an example, take tau 1 to be, this is random, by the way, uh, the square root of 13, and tau 2 to be 9 times the square root of 2. Okay. So this 
analog, I'll put quotation marks around it because this doesn't make sense, of j tau 1 minus j tau 2 that we get, what is it equal to? It's some number. I didn't tell you how to define it. But one thing that we should already note is that unlike Gross and Zagier, we have a choice to make. Right? We have to choose a prime p. And in fact, we have an infinite number of choices of such a prime p, so that effectively introduces some kind of new variable into the story that Gross and Zagier didn't see that gives some new uh, interesting arithmetic phenomena. But for this particular example, I'll just choose one. I'll choose p equals 19, which is inert in both of these real quadratic fields. Now, we can compute this quantity numerically and see what we get out. And we observe that we get something like uh, 43 plus this number divided out by this. So this is a numerical computation that shows us this. And like before, there are many arithmetic things that you can note about this and many other examples. For instance, these primes that appear, again, are inert in both of these uh, fields. No, no, we have, of course, a specific, this quotation mark thing is a specific quantity, which we would take much longer to explain to you what it is. But then we compute it numerically, and we find that it's this value. And we find that, in fact, we can make very precise conjectures about which primes appear here, and what these exponents are. And again, just like in the story of singular moduli, they turn out to be uh, arithmetic intersection numbers. OK, now, in full generality, this is sort of the end, but I just want to say a little bit about uh, the questions I'd like to think about this year. In full generality, we have a lot of conjectures. We can't prove all of them. We can prove certain special cases, and we're working on others. Uh, and those are sort of the questions that I'd like to continue thinking about uh, this year. And so one fruitful strategy in proving this kind of candidate analog of CM theory in the RM case is to look at these two proofs that Gross and Zagier have. So they have an analytic proof and an algebraic proof. Now, for the analytic proof, there are actually perfectly good analogs of all of these things in the piadic world. And in joint work with uh, Hari Darman and also Alice Pozzi, we actually succeed at proving some of these conjectures in certain cases by replacing this real analytic Eisenstein family by a piadic analytic Eisenstein family. Um, on a more speculative note, I'm also very interested in what the analogs would be of this algebraic proof, where, of course, the, the glaring gap is a lack of an RM theory that we can use, which was available to um, Gross and Zagier. So those are roughly the kinds of questions I'd like to think about. And with that, I think I'll stop. And thanks very much. <laughs>